the problem of consciousness, I think, is a little bit like the problem of life. <laughs> and that is that it isn't going to be answered with a single experiment or ex set of experiments. And it isn't going to be answered by looking for correlations between this and that. I think it's going to require that we understand the nature of declarative memory and how it's different from skilled learning. It's going to require we understand the various attentional systems, the top-down one that we can, as it were, consciously control, and the bottom-up one that makes us turn our heads to a flash or a sound. We're going to need to understand more about the emotions and the role that they have. And, and all of these funny things that play a role in consciousness, like feeling dizzy, uh, feeling well, feeling fatigued, these are extremely important signals um, for the well-being of the body. And they're part of what has to be integrated in order for people or for animals with brains to make good judgments about what to do. I mean, do you have any, uh, I mean, do you So make, I don't think we know. Yeah, but do you, you don't make any sort of little cutoffs here and say, well, um, humans are conscious, other creatures aren't, or... Oh, no. Or you need language to be conscious, no. as Dan would not I, Dan I don't Dan think so. I mean, that, you know, bear in mind that we differ from mice in only 300 genes that Paul is more similar genetically to a male chimpanzee than he is to me. There's not a lot of room I would say genetically. So, yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot oh, okay. of room for something that's wholly and completely new. And besides, what we see in many animals is the kind of flexibility in action and behavior that's very similar to the kind of flexibility in human planning and, and organization that seems to need awareness. Okay. May so, I, there's, yes. a, there's a point that wants making uh, at, at this juncture. Um, upon hearing of how we might come to understand how brain pathology can produce social pathology, upon hearing that we may come to understand how consciousness is produced by God knows what mechanisms in the brain, a common reaction is to say, this is frightening, this is reductionistic, this is uh, making mm -hmm. us small, it's, it's cold and it's frightening and it's dehumanizing, and I appreciate those feelings, and I want to suggest that exactly the opposite is true, and here the reasons why. As we come to understand more deeply and slowly gain control over the various kinds of pathology of character or intellect or memory, we will be able to take better care of our children and our brothers and our sisters and our loved ones. As a result of coming to understand how a person's consciousness and uh, the person's personality, the profile of uh, cognitive and social virtues they display, as a result of coming to understand and how those things uh, develop in the course of a lifetime, we'll be in a much better position to ward off predations. We can save people from disasters that might otherwise befall them. We will see more deeply into the reality that is another person, and therefore we will be able to take better care of it. Uh, I can sum this up by saying what you understand better, you can have better control over. That which you control allows you to intervene and to modulate. Uh, it takes you from a situation where you have no freedom at all because you're simply a hostage to a fate you don't understand to a case where, to a situation where you actually have some freedom. You have some foresight. You can see what's going on. I think this will lead to greater humanization of the uh, uh, individual humans. I think it will allow us to be uh, more kind, more insightful. Uh, more caring about other people and much more effective in bringing about. I don't fear it at all. Uh, on the whole, knowledge is power and power can always be abused for sure. But uh, power that can reduce misery and make us see more deeply into each other's souls is knowledge we should seek 